uh, the theme of Christmas throughout December, <laughs> and we come today to the uh, time that we're going to celebrate in uh, officialness traditionally of uh, the birth of Jesus Christ. Nobody knows exactly when that was. Uh, this has been accepted by, I guess, the majority of the world, uh, the Christian world, to believe that Jesus is going to be celebrated on the uh, 25th of December. And I love the little song uh, that uh, the little fellow sang here just a minute ago yes, about Jesus. Happy birthday, amen. Jesus. Amen. amen. And uh, I really appreciate that and them singing today. Uh, to me, uh, I think about all the uh, festivities and lights and tree and everything I mentioned before, uh, but it's all about Jesus and recognizing and celebrating uh, His birthday. Amen. I'm not commanded in the Word of God to do it, but I think it is so neat uh, that uh, we have chosen today as, as a, a, a world, a, a creation, uh, to worship Him and to give Him uh, a special time of remembrance in a world that has thought with so many other things to add to it yes. and has taken away the meaning. I'm glad today uh, that we can still stop for a little while and recognize the meaning that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Amen. That baby that was in a manger is coming back one day to be our King. Amen. Turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 2. I've got a number of places I want you to go with me in the Word of God today. So keep your Bibles handy. <laughs> so that you can read along. If you're not going to be able to do it that quickly with me this morning, at least right now where I'm going so you can get together with it later and read, read about it. And the whole thing uh, about Christmas today is we recognize uh, who He is. Amen? Amen? And so the title of the message is, That's Him. Amen? That's so what I would think about uh, all the ways that people might acknowledge Jesus and uh, be able to give Him some kind of special place in their heart Today of all days, amen, recognize for sure, that's Him. That's what the trees are about, what the lights are about, or what the decorations are about, and all the gifts, that's what it's all about. All of them hung on an evergreen tree, continuing to be green. Jesus, ever the same, all of that tells me about Jesus Christ today. And so if that's Him, that's the point I want to make. Luke chapter 2 and verse 8 that's where I'm going to start. And I ask you to pray uh, that the Lord would give me uh, what I need to say that you might be able to share in the joy that I feel uh, for Christmas uh, that God has blessed us with this day. Amen? And we'll tie, uh, try our best to tie it all together. Alright, Luke chapter 2. I'm going to start with verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were sore afraid and the angel said unto them fear not for behold I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior which is Christ the Lord and this shall be a sign unto you ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger probably not two of those in Bethlehem right probably not two of them in the world kind of singled them out and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace goodwill toward men and it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, uh, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. Not the angels, but the Lord has made it known unto us. Let us pray. Father, we magnify your name and thank you, God, for this season of Christmas that you have blessed us with. We have this privilege and opportunity to enjoy with our family, our loved ones, our co-workers, and our community as we go about and we see all of the things that are involved in this time of year. And I pray, God, that we will and always will be able to step back and see the lights and everything about it, all the decorations, and yet understand uh, that Jesus Christ is that light. 
He is the decoration of our lives. And I pray that I might be able to share that this morning. Have your way with each one that's here, each life, each home, I pray. May your sweet spirit abide and you knowing the need. Deal with us according to your wondrous love. For all these things, we're going to give you praise. Father, I give us an altar service. Be it according to your divine holy will. It's in Christ's wonderful name we pray. And amen. amen. All right, so that's him. Amen. That's the point uh, that we need to get across that the shepherds have made something been made known to them by God, by the Lord, uh, that this thing that's happened in Bethlehem is for them and they're having a desire and understanding that get to the place where that they see this thing, they hear this thing, they're, they're moved at the light and the angel chorus, the army that was there, everything that was going on, and they're drawn to say to themselves at that particular time, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which the Lord hath made known, known unto us. So at that point, they're believing God, right? Amen. They're believing that what little understanding they have of prophecy and of the Messiah of Christ, they're at that place where they're believing that that's what we're supposed to do. That's Him. And we know and we understand by the rest of the story that they get there and they understand and they believe that that's Jesus Christ. That's the baby. All right, go with me to Luke, or Matthew rather, chapter 2. I'm not going to read a whole bunch, but I want to give her enough of it for us to understand, drawing it all together. Matthew chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. And so wise men come from the east, they get to the place, and they say in verse 2, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Look at verse 9. And when they heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So when the uh, shepherds went, he was still a little baby wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in the mangers. When the wise men went, he was already 12 to 24 months old. He's in a house and they come and they present the gifts and they worship him. Uh, so the shepherds uh, have the information from God they believe the wise men get the information of the scripture. Of their believing God, they find out where the baby king is. The son that saw the star, they rejoice once again. They find him in the house, and they present him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh gifts fit for a king. And so they believed and they worshipped him. Amen. And so, do you know? Do you believe? that Jesus Christ is Lord. Do you accept Him as your Lord and Savior? One of these days, He's going to be your judge. He's going to be king, amen, in your life. And He's going to have control. He's going to have authority. He's going to reign. And you need to know that. You need to trust that. You need to believe that in your heart and in your life. Not because I say it, but because the Word of God said it, amen. And the Word of God is the last authority that there is. Amen. Over top of Obama, over top of Trump, over top of whoever, Jesus Christ's word will stand when all the rest yes. are gone. Amen. Go back to Luke for just a moment in chapter 2. And I want to pick up where I, I got the idea that's him. The shepherd said that's him. The wise men said that's him. But in the early time, we go to Luke chapter 2 and verse 25. And behold, there was a wise man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And go to verse 26 now. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ and came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child to do for him after the custom of the law, uh, then he took up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace 
according to thy word. For my eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all the people, and a light to light the Gentile, and the glory of thy people Israel. And so Simeon had recognition from God, revelation, and he believed, and he worshipped God at the moment. Uh, that's going on. And go to Anna now in verse 36 and verse 38. Uh, and there was one Anna, a prophetess of the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher, which she was of great age and lived in a husband seven years from her virginity. She was a widow of about fourscore and four years and departed not from the temple, but served God in fasting and prayers night and day. And coming in in an instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of Him, Jesus, to all them that looked for redemption in Israel. Simeon believed and I believe they had instruction and information from God. And let me tell you, friend, this morning, that's all the revelation you need to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's everything you need. God has given in His Word for us to know who He is. And I'm telling you this morning, that's Him. There is no other that fulfills Scripture like Jesus does. There may have been a few that could come close to it if the parents knew ahead of time and they programmed it all out. But you go to the Old Testament, you go to the New Testament, you go to people's lives who were deep and messed up in sin and you see the change that God made in them. My friend, there's proof positive that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Amen. From the manger to the cross to the ascension. Amen. To the rapture and to His kingdom coming. All of that points to Jesus Christ. And there's nobody else in history that fulfills that obligation that Jesus Christ has been proved to be God. Amen. Some fella said one time, why even Jesus didn't say when He was God. Let's read a little bit about that. I believe that He did. Look with me in the book of Isaiah chapter 61. Remember I asked you if you would to write it down or follow this with me so that you can have this fresh in your heart. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1 and 2. And He said this. Isaiah said this about the Messiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, so he's being instructed by God, revelation by God, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Verse 2 to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now I'm going to stop there because what's the rest of verse 2 talks about judgment that's to come. But I and that's going to prove who he is to those that refuse him. But I want us to understand what I'm talking about. And go with me into Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. Jesus is teaching the people and He's instructing them. He's in Capernaum now and He's going to be given a little sermon, if you will. Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. And when He came to Nazareth where He had been brought up, as His custom was, He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto Him, think about this, the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when He had opened the book, He found the place where it is writ It was written. Now let me stop there for just a moment. In the synagogue back in olden days, uh, they chose verses of Scripture a year ahead. And so just by faith, just by chance, just by revelation, uh, Jesus shows up on this particular day in Capernaum in the synagogue and all of a sudden of all the readings that's been done up to this time when they deliver Jesus the scroll, He opens it up to the exact place that I read to you just a moment ago in Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1 and verse 2 at least part of verse 2. Let's go now to the rest of what we need to read. Verse 18. This is where Isaiah picked it up. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath appointed hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives the recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the lord 
That's what Isaiah said the Messiah was going to do. Now, in other words, Jesus is saying, that's me. Amen. He's trying to get it to understand. That's me. You may not be blind. You may not think you're in prison. You may not be bound by, by man or anything like that. You may not have sickness, disease. You may not be dead. Amen. But that's still me. I'm telling you, that's me. I am the Messiah. That's what the world needs to know and understand that Jesus Christ has come into the world to save sinners. Yes. Amen. The Apostle Paul said, of whom I am chief. Doesn't matter who you are, how far down low you've gotten, Jesus Christ is able to lift you up, set your feet on the solid rock, amen, and give you the joy and peace that the shepherds, that the wise men had, that Anna and Simeon had, amen, that they could say, here is the Christ child, amen. That is Him. That's what they were trying to get across. Look with me in another place now. In John chapter 7. <clears throat> I'm going to read quite a bit. I'm not going to get deep in all of it, but read quite a bit. I want to hit it with you. Uh, John chapter 7, verse 25. Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? Meaning that they were going to kill Jesus. He's teaching them. He's teaching them things that they didn't appreciate. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He's talking to the religious people of the day. He's talking to the political people of the day. He's letting them know that, amen, you've got your agenda, but I'm on the plan and authority of God. And so the common people hear the teaching of Jesus. They see all these people around that want to kill Him, and they're marveling and amazed that they're not doing anything about it to grab a hold of it. Here he is. It's our chance to kill Jesus. Reach out, touch him. He's there. And what do they do? They stand back in amazement as they hear the teaching that Jesus has got. Verse 26. But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ, amen. Whether they did or not, some of them did, but whether they did or not, amen, the common people picked up on it. What did they pick up on? That do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ. This is Him, in other words, or that's Him. How be it? We know that when this, this man, we know this man whence He is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Where did he come from? Amen. We know where this guy came from. We Nobody knows when Christ is, is going to come, where he come from. Then cried Jesus in the temple. He taught them, saying, Ye both know me, and ye know whence I am. And I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. In other words, God sent me, and you don't know him. Amen. That's pretty good slap in the face. That's pretty hard preaching. Amen. He might not want to take up an offering at this particular juncture. Amen. But I know him for I have come from him and he has sent me. And they sought to take him but no man laid hands on him because an hour was not yet come. They sought to take him. How did they seek to take him? You go get him. No, you go get him. Amen. No, you go get him. Listen to what he's saying. You go get him. They sought to take him, but no man dared to go up to him. He was there. He was available. He could have been easily captured and apprehended, but no man came to take him. Amen. Verse 31. What does this reinforce? Many of the people believed on him that that's him. And said, when Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? Amen. Proof positive, it's him. Remember, I told you in time past, numbers of times, that the things that Jesus did, the miracles that he did, was his record of credentials. This is who I am. These, this, my miracles will introduce me to let you know that I am the Christ. Brother Wick, if I could see a miracle today, I believe. Friend, you don't need a miracle. The Word of God has been able to stand strong and firm and authoritative and has been made known to be true. It is the truth of the Word of God when all of the rest of men's words have fallen by the wayside. That to me is proof. 
I don't have time to go in it this morning, but you think of all of the people that tried to destroy the Word of God, all the people that tried to kill Jesus Christ, and all of the Bibles that they have tried to annihilate and get rid of. Amen. The Bible has been banned in all kinds of countries. It's been put on a low of read book. A list has been burned. It's done all these things too. And what has survived? The Word of God has survived. Why? Because God said, My Word is forever settled. In heaven. Amen. You can count on it when you stand before God. There's just one book of 66 volumes that's going to be opened and every one of us are going to be judged out of. What word is that? It is called the Holy Bible. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. And so Jesus teaching from that book. And let's go on a little bit. Many of the people believed. The Pharisees heard the people murmured such things concerning him. And the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. They heard. They said, hey, y'all come over here, you officers. You high priests, you uh, soldiers. I want that man arrested. Then they, uh, they said to Jesus, uh, yet a little while I'm going to live with you. And when I go unto him, that said to ye shall see me, shall not find me. Where I am hither, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, <coughs> Whither will he go that we shall not find him? Will he go into the dispersed? Will he go to the Gentiles? Teach the Gentile. Amen to that. What manner of saying is this? That he said, Ye shall seek me and shall not find me. And where I am thither you cannot come. In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Let me put that into context. And during the time of the feast that they're talking about, uh, there would be water that would somebody or a priest would go and he would draw water out of the Gaikon spring. And he would take it up on the temple mount and he'd give it to the high priest. And at a particular time during the service, the high priest would pour out the water as an oblation or a service to Christ. And so it was an offering they would pour it out. It's at that particular time when the high priest is pouring out that water which they were thanking God for. Remember in this part of the country, water was not very pure. What water they had was not very good and there was not a great amount of it. And so they poured out as an offering to God to give more. It's at that particular time that Jesus is in the temple area and he says if any man thirsts as the water is being poured out. Let him come unto me and drink. In other words, Jesus is saying, I am the living water. He tried to let him know, that's me. That's him. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spake of the Spirit, which they believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Many of the people, therefore, they heard this saying of the truth. That's him. That's the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Well, that's where he traveled out of. But where was Christ born? In Bethlehem of Judea, as it was written of the prophets. Have not the scripture said that Christ cometh out of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? I wrote in the margin of my Bible, yes. That's him. So there was a division among the people because of him. Why was there a division among the people because of them? Because they did not know the scripture. Amen. That's why it's important to read the word. That's why it's important to have memory verses. So that you can know the Word of God. So that somebody that starts preaching something that's false, you can catch on to it. So that you won't be deterred away from Him. Because that's Him. I want to convince you that I believe that's Him. Now you may not believe, but I want you to know that I believe. Amen. I can't think for you, but I can think for me. And I can impress upon you what I believe. Whether you believe it or not, I believe it's Him. Amen. And some of them would have taken Him, but, but no man laid hands on Him. Some of them would have taken Him, but no man laid hands on Him. Later on, they got together. Why didn't you go? No, I was waiting on you. If you'd have went, I'd have went. Amen. Ain't that the way the world is? Huh? How many times have I heard people during altar call? Well, if you went to altar, I've been right behind you. Huh? You could have got him then. You'd have got him in the right way, in the right manner. Amen. You'd have just come. Why didn't we wait? 
I know why they waited. It was not Jesus' time yet. That's why they waited. But why do people wait when the altar call is given? When the Holy Ghost of God is moving? When they feel God stirring in their heart and their life and He's trying to make a change and have given that living water? Why do they wait then? Because the devil said, not today. Tomorrow. Next time. Next week. Next Sunday. Next Christmas. Next Easter. You know what happens? Eventually, the next time does it come? Right. Why have you not brought him? No man laid hands on him. Then the officers of the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto him, Why have you not brought him? Why have you not brought Jesus? I told you I sent you to arrest him. Why didn't you take him? What was their answer? Never a man spake like this man. Mm -hmm. That was the answer. He was making a difference in their heart. He was making a difference in the way that they thought. They had heard religious teachers and religious preachers and prophets and false prophets and they heard all of these different speakers and things like that. But then they came down and they're hearing it from the Word of God themselves. The officers answered, Never a man spake like this man. And I guarantee you and I affirm to you this morning that never a man spake like Jesus spake. Do you believe that this morning? Amen. Do you believe the woman that was taken in adultery in John 8 believed that no man ever spake like Jesus men after all the men brought her to Jesus said, Master, Moses and the law said she should be stoned. But what sayest thou? What did Jesus say? He just stooped and rolled in the ground, didn't he? And they continued to ask him, What do you say? Jesus said, I'll tell you what I say. Let him that is among you without sin cast the first stone. What did they do? They dropped them stones, didn't they? Amen. Never a man spake like Jesus spake. Went to the woman at the well in John 4. And, he, and this woman was a woman who was real, real loose morals, uh, if she had any morals at all. And he says, woman, give me a drink of water. He said, she said, well, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. You're not supposed to be talking to me. Well, never a man spake like Jesus spake. That's a sermon title. Hey, man, I just come up with a sermon. Never a man spake like Jesus spake. And then he said, yeah, but you, he said, you're going to come and get water and you have to come back another day to get water. He said, I'm going to give you water that you'll never thirst of. You won't have to have a bucket. You won't have to come draw it. He said, you can take that water home with you. You can leave the bucket. You can take the water home with you. What'd she do? She left the bucket and took the water home with her. Hey, my She believed, didn't she? That's him. I'll look at the next part. Then answered some of the Pharisees, uh, are you deceived? And have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? Have any of the rulers believed on him? Here's the answer. Yes. Amen. There's a couple of them. But the people know not the law are cursed. Nicodemus said to him that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, doeth our law judge any man before to hear him and know what he doeth? They answered, said unto him, Art thou the uh, of Galilee? Search out, look, for out of Galilee arises no prophet, and every man went into his own house. Say by him. He's teaching the people. He's instructing them, giving them knowledge that they can know and understand that is Him. The lepers were healed and believed and knew that that's Him. The families whose dead son and daughter were raised back to life, they believed and knew that that was Him. The stormy, a still wind and cold and water uh, believed and knew that that was Him when He stilled them. Amen. The woman with the issue of blood for 12 years that touched the hem of the garment, she believed and knew that that's Him. The unclean spirits in Mark chapter 5, which I'm going to read next, uh, believed and understood uh, that that was Him. <laughs> Mark chapter 5. Verse 1. And they came into the other side of the sea, the country of the Gadareans, 
When he's come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no man could bind him, no not with chain, because they had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always night and day was in the mountains and the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stone. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Couldn't be tamed. Couldn't be bound. Had his dwelling among the dead in tombs. In fact, you might say, having the demons in him, he was just the walking dead, wouldn't he? He was just one of those that was just waiting to lay down. Having all of these things wrong with him, these demons, he was already dead. But when he saw Jesus far off, he came and worshipped him. Look at verse 7. And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I drew thee by God that thou torment me not. So who's speaking now? The demons are speaking now, right? And what are they saying? I know who you are. Amen. That's him. That's what the demons were saying. That's the one we're going to be judged by. That's the one that's going to appoint us hell. <coughs> And he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him what his name was. And he said, My answer, my name is Legion, for we are many. And if he sought them much, he would not send them away out of the country. They knew he could send those demons out. Now there was near the mountain a herd of swine feeding. The devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, we may enter into them. They knew that Jesus had power to remove them. For when Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out, entered into the swine, and ran a uh, herd, and went violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. The dumb, demonized pigs at that point knew Jesus. That's Him. Amen. Time forces me to stop. Let's go back to Luke <coughs> chapter 2 <coughs> to finish with. <coughs> Luke chapter 2, verse 19. One verse of Scripture. Let this truth grasp your heart this morning and understand and know. I don't want you to buy off on religion. Do you hear me? I don't want you to buy off on religion and believe uh, a, a, a catechism, a teaching uh, of, of man. But I do want you to understand this. That Jesus Christ, even though He was born of the Jews, came into the world to be the Savior of all. When John saw Jesus coming to the baptism, John said, look, there's the Savior of the Jews. No, he didn't say that. But what he did say is, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He came to be the Savior of whosoever will. Of all the world, if they would come, he would want to save them. Look at verse 19. That Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. That Mary kept all these things. What things? Quickly, those things I want to share with you this morning. She kept them in her heart and pondered them. The word pondered means she turned them over and over. She thought on them. She kept thinking about them. She didn't let them rest. Everything that had happened and everything that she had heard and seen started turning over with her. And she was trying to make all of everything kind of mesh together, make sense, didn't she? Of everything she heard. Now, she didn't know all the plan that God had for her baby Jesus. But she was starting to put things together because she thought on them. She kept them in her heart and she pondered on them. Let me tell you, that's good advice. What God's Word says, you keep it in your heart. You think on it. You turn it over. Amen. God didn't want you to leave your brain at the door when you come in this morning. Amen. He wants you to bring it inside. Amen. God says in Isaiah, come now let us reason together, said the Lord. So God wants you to think about what He's got to say to you. And understand that it's the truth this morning. So she kept all these things in her part. All that happened. She thought about the virgin birth. Not being married and not having a husband. She thought about the words that came from the angels. She thought about what Joseph agreed with, what God had told Joseph, her husband. She thought about what the shepherds had to say, what the wise men had to say, 
what Simeon had to say, what Anna had to say, because all of them believed and they accepted and understood that that's him. Mary, she believed. Joseph, he believed that that's him. From the manger to the cross to the resurrection to the ascension to the rapture to the kingdom age, that's him. Amen. There he is. No other. One of the greatest Bible scholars that I've ever read after uh, by the name of Wilson wrote a volume uh, that's at least that thick. Wrote a volume that's that, that thick on the Bible and on, on, on the Word of God and on Jesus. And he knew all of the biblical lang languages, was, had all kind of masters and degrees in theology and everything like that, on, on the very first lid of his uh, book, he writes down all the reasons why he has the knowledge and understanding that he has about who Jesus is. And at the end of it, he said, he believed that Jesus was Jesus because the Bible told him so. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. After all the knowledge and instruction he had, what proved to him that Jesus was the Christ was what the Bible told him. Amen? We read about the books the different uh, lawyers have written proof, the verdict that Jesus is the Christ. Uh, Josh McDowell and different ones have tried to prove that Jesus was not Savior, that He wasn't actually here. It's just a story. As they studied to make sure that they could prove that He was not, they came to the conclusion that He was. You know, that's why I believe that a new person or somebody that's seeking a new Christian needs to study the book of John. Yeah. The Gospel of John first. Because John set out to prove one thing, that Jesus was the Messiah that was prophesied to come into the world. But it all boils down for me just like it does for a lot of people today. Whenever the Jesus is, is in uh, Caesarea Philippi, up in the north by the uh, area of Dan, where they had all kind of idol worship. We went to Dan when we were in Israel, and there's a, a cliff uh, uh, up there. And in the cliff, uh, they got out some little notches cut into the side of the, of the stone. And they, they've got a little place for these little things that they would bring. Their little statues and their little figurines of their gods. And Jesus and the disciples traveled to that place on the particular day that I'm talking about. And Jesus turns to the disciples and says, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And some said, You are Moses, or you're Elijah, or you're one of the other prophets. And then Jesus said this, and you know this very well, don't you? Here's what Jesus said, But whom do you say that I yes, am? Amen. It's personal, don't it? You can't believe what I believe. You've got to believe what you believe. I want to convince you. I'm convinced. But you've got to be convinced. I agree with Peter. Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter believed that's Him. You believe that's Him this morning. The greatest gift that was ever given was talked about by these beautiful little kids that sung this morning. The real gift is you. The real gift is you. All the things we do, no matter how much it costs, no matter how pretty it is, how personal what you give today as a gift or last night uh, to somebody that you love, no, no matter what value it has on it, the greatest gift that was ever given is Jesus Christ. God gave His best. We're talking about the divine God, the Creator, the Almighty God of the universe, of all creation, gave His best. His best was Himself in the person of Jesus Christ. He gave that gift to you and I that we might have forgiveness of sin, that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. As you stand, if you will, let's get an invitation number three.